Hello and welcome to another episode of The Zoo. This is The Christmas Show and I'm Alf Oberheilen. To joining me today is Simon King and Aaron Avery. Welcome, Simon. Welcome. How are you doing? Hi, Aaron. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me out. How's the weather in Dallas? It's beautiful. The sun came out. Great. Because in Tahoe, it's three degrees. So. Yeah, it's freezing down here in California. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm in Boston today, actually, and it's 50 degrees outside. I'm it's slightly overheating, so it's, it's amazingly strange. Anyway, we're going to talk about predictions for 2016 or observations of 2015. I'll start with you, Erin. What are the two major observations that you have for this year that is about to end? That, that's about to end? So I think that 2015, you could, you could sum up one word in 2015, and that word is digital. It was everywhere. So I really think that my, when I look back on 2015, it's about the, the rise of digital, although it's been rising for a while, but I think it, it, it hit the summit in 2015. And then the, the kind of digital identity in the latter half of the year that organizations are starting to wrap their head around and realizing perhaps that they've already started to create their digital identity, whether they uh, it was intended or otherwise. And so that's created an interesting situation for everybody involved, let's face it, not just IT, but tech owners in general, which will, you know, we get into the 2016 pr uh, predictions I think that the the digital identity, the digital awakening, and just the overall year of digital in 2015 is really going to inform 2016. Okay. And that's something we hear in a lot of corners of our IT market. Anything that is that surprised you that you thought wouldn't really happen in 2015? You know, I, <laughs> the... Uh, it wasn't so much surprises as much as it was just the kind of the the awakening of some of the people in their role in, in digital. It took a little bit longer than perhaps uh, one would have expected. But I, what I do see, especially in the latter half of the year, is that people are coming around to the notion and really establishing where where they fit in this new paradigm, or maybe adopting the fact that there is no perfect fit and uh, people are asserting their role, and I love that. I mean, what a great opportunity for people to kind of define their future. And so it's, um, it's not so much surprise, but it just it took a little bit, a while for people to kind of wake up to it, but now they've gleaned onto it. I think that there's some excitement uh, to be had. Do you agree with that, Simon? Do you think? I do, yeah. definitely. Now, I think that's this digital thing is uh, actually behind the curves, and we think we've been digital very long, and it's finally people wake up, but I tend to be uh, too far ahead of the curve anyway. So I'm glad that it's becoming mainstream because God knows there's no analog businesses left. I mean, <laughs> farming is probably the most digital, you know, made the biggest stride in the digital world of, of them all. Simon, any major observations on your part? I, you know, I think, you know, for me in 2015, Wearable devices, and, and I know some of us would say that they haven't yet met their stride, but um, you know, you're starting to look around and the technology to build wearables and therefore its ability to be incorporated into any manner of devices is starting to, to hit stride. And with it, you know, a whole bunch of cloud services, whether it's a, a platform like this, which I, which I haven't used before, but is a very cool, easy to use platform. You know, I think the user experience for these cloud services is, is really starting to, to raise the bar quite significantly uh, uh, in 2015. You know, you're starting to see Uber and companies like that really start to assert what it means to have a stable, reliable, pervasive, easy to use cloud service. I think, yeah, I think wearables is, is going to take off faster than we think. It, it started out something cool, but A, I think I'm getting one for Christmas. I hope my wife doesn't want it. <laughs> um, but I think sooner rather than later, our employers and our insurance companies will know when we're going to have a heart attack before we do, which is good and bad. And, you know, it, it, it will change the world for better or worse. And, and I, I have a lot of faith in, in wearables uh, beyond just wristbands. You know, uh, it's going to be interesting to see. What else? What else do you think has happened out there, Simon? Well, you know, I think, you know, basically, you know, looking out and around, I think the nature of having all these cloud services out there is forcing a wake up call in IT. The, you know, IT that previously has just been serving, 
you know, corporate users and giving them good enough service. They're now being held to a bar by all these, you know, consumer services that's forcing them to wake up. I, I was at a client just last week and then I noticed um, in the news uh, yesterday, they got kudos for uh, having an Uber-like interface for consumer support as an ISP. Mm -hmm. Right, so you can actually see where the person was as they were coming to your uh, house to to provide service. I mean, we've been so used to to poor service, and I think capabilities like that going into the hands of consumers are going to start to force the hand within corporate IT. You know, who's helping who? Right. So as as we engage with people, it's going to be much easier to see them, uh, engage with them, find out where they are, what are they doing, what's the state of, of the work they're doing for us. And it'll force a lot higher degree of collaboration. You know, Slack and tools like that are really starting to change the game around collaboration and communication. And I think, I, I honestly don't think we've seen the full impression of that yet. I think the platforms are there. I think the platforms are cool. I think teams of early adopters have, have started to make heavy use of them. But I think the full impact of the cultural change that must naturally follow could be, I mean, we may not recognize the companies of the future in, in a couple of years. Yeah, and I think, Simon, you just hit on a, a, kind of my second uh, point around this digital identity and where people fit and this awakening, the cultural aspect. I submit to you that a lot of the technology is there and the technology is outpacing the culture. And I just came back from a large uh, conference, an analyst conference, and the, the conversations around me you know, after sessions ended or in the hallway, sometimes we're a little, um, little astonishing. Like, wait a second, haven't you, haven't you tackled that yet? But what I realized was most of those conversations had to do with the, uh, the people and the cultural aspects. And there seems to be this general awareness that, sure, the technology isn't going to fix this. And we've talked about this for, I mean, forever in IT, about technology doesn't fix people problems. Uh, right. in, in fact, sometimes it just exacerbates it. But with the rise of all of these different types of technologies, these levels of awareness that the technology brings to us, uh, the, the onus is really on leadership to help establish these cultures where people um, feel empowered and emboldened to use these new technologies to create uh, different kinds of services, better levels of service, uh, and, and not say, oh, that's not part of our process or that's not part of our culture or whatever. Okay, forget it. I mean, it's the, the digital awakening has occurred and it's there's a huge opportunity for people to define themselves you know in the face of the future not so much in the face of the present or of the past yeah i think you're i mean i want my electrician to have one of those gps on it so i know where the hell he is there you go and aren't you about to renovate your house or renovating your house up in dallas aaron yeah that's going to be a, a an ongoing project <laughs> But I tell you what, if I knew where all of the, the contractors were, I would be, uh, let's just say this project would go a lot faster. Yeah, either that or you go crazy of frustration because they don't give it up. I think that actually could be a competitive differentiator for, for a handyman. So uh, we include the GPS service and now we know where we are and we know when we're coming. And, and, and I would use them. I'll pay a little bit extra. I know them. I mean, just, just to have that peace of mind. Uh, so it's a very interesting uh, point there. So uh, a, a seven hour window isn't uh, defined enough for you, Al? The cable people, right? Let's not, anyway, let's not get it. cable anymore, Al? Come on. <laughs> I do. Oh, you try to put up a, a direct TV thing in, in the snowstorms we have? Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, um, so moving forward to 2016 and, and staying with you, Erin, what what's your biggest prediction? What do you think is going to happen? Hoverboard for everybody? No, because Amazon just killed it. And let's face it, everything good comes from Amazon these days. Uh, well, you told me to come with two, so I've got two. Yeah. Uh, and, and like a child, I can't choose my favorite. But, but I do have two, and I think that they are uh, equal in their opportunity to affect IT pros for 2016, but also uh, completely different. So the first one is really around capacity uh, and aligning the capacity of technology resources with business services. And this is a, a discipline that's been around traditional IT shops for, for a long time. But we're seeing a huge resurgence in this topic. And you know, most of you all know that we make a pretty awesome capacity management solution, if I, if I do say so myself.
But regardless of that, the application of capacity management to some of these uh, newer and emerging technologies um, like uh, you know big data and AWS and, and OpenStack and really aligning those technology resources and not over provisioning and overspending and just getting you know I liken it to Goldilocks and the Three Bears you know you got you know too little you got too much and you got just right and the opportunity when everything requires some level of capacity is making sure that your tank is fueled just to the right level, not overspending and not underspending, and applying that management technique or that notion to not only your traditional IT resources, uh, like WAN links and things like that, and servers and, and things of that nature, but also applying the same discipline to some of these more modern technologies. That's going to be a, a huge opportunity, a huge win for the organizations that get that right, because uh, you, let's face it, there is, there's only so many you know, dollars and cents to go around. And so being able to effectively understand and manage that capacity and know, let the data drive your decision-making process and be able to say with a, a high degree of certainty that yes, we've got these resources provisioned correctly. Yeah. So, so I think that that's a huge near-term win for um, IT organizations, and then IT organizations to help the business has adopted some of those uh, new technologies. Um, the second thing that I think is, if I take a step back, uh, you know, if 2015 was the year of the digital awakening, I think 2016 is going to be the year that of the data-driven decision. And Go gone on. will be the days of the hunch, the gut feel, the uh, you know, the ongoing multi-hour war room. Um, and I really believe that there's a huge opportunity to lever, leverage a single analytics platform that multiple different people, whether it's technology owners in the business or IT pros or leaders or business leaders, whoever it is, to basically swim in the same lake of data and pull that data and apply the machine learning techniques and apply his advanced analytics techniques and historical and real-time analysis to make very uh, fast, accurate decisions. So I, you know, if, if 26 or 2015 was the degree of the digital kind of awakening, uh, then 2016 is really gonna be the year of the data-driven decision. Yeah, we need to switch from big data to actually like real information or as Simon like to call it, small data, I think you refer to it like. What are your predictions for, for 2016, Simon? Every company is gonna be a software company. Ah, that's my big one. What, the, does, what does that mean? <laughs> well, the, you know, the very nature of... I hope you have to show up to 2016 to find out. <laughs> not so far away, right? So, you know, I, I, what I'm seeing is that, you know, all these companies that previously have had products and classical services, as they compete in a, in a modern age with the likes of Uber and Amazon, they're going to be dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century and, and have to create really compelling user experiences, and they're gonna to need to build up their software company capabilities. You know, I, I look at, I was just reviewing a presentation yesterday from eBay, and, you know, I, I think of a classical corporate IT group doing, you know, 300 changes a month, you know, that kind of thing. eBay was espousing that they're doing a thousand builds a day, a thousand deploys a day, a thousand releases a year. And that must strike real fear into the hearts of a, a classical corporate IT person, hmm. A, that they could actually manage that pace, B, that they could plan and figure out what on earth to put in that volume of changes, and C, that they'd have to build up the technology and the skills they need in-house to be able to deploy that kind of pace of change without having significant problems, you know, Wall Street Journal level problems. And so, I, you know, I, I think that wearables and, you know, the drive for, higher direct engagement with consumers is going to drive a real shift in terms of how companies think about the role of IT, no longer just the enabler for employees in terms of email and SharePoint and, you know, basic apps, but like a real drive to, um, you know, to, to becoming a software company. And that's going to mean a real war on uh, skills and talent. The, you know, not every location is going to have as much talent and skills that they want. So that means they're going to have to retrain people. They're going to have to retain people, the, the good ones, because they're going to be trying to be poached by other companies. We've started to see some of that 
you know, amongst Apple and Tesla and Google and Facebook. And, you know, as that spreads, I think that will be quite a challenge for organizations to, to embrace because it, because it will require a culture change to have them say, yes, this is the, co the company that you joined is the company you should stay at if, it do if they don't change and adapt the culture fast enough. Well, yeah, I think there's a lot of examples of that right now. Uh, I was in Vancouver recently. They don't have um, um, Uber there. But the cab companies have their apps. Now, their apps are not at all as good as Uber, but it's the beginning of something. And, mm -hmm. and a few years ago, you, they were like, we building an app. Are you crazy? No, no, no. You call us and we come and pick you up. <laughs> um, and, and then you look at Tesla and they're, they don't hire guys from, from Detroit. They hire people from Mountain View and Cupertino because, you know, Elon's saying, these guys have been trained to think about cars. We don't build cars, so we don't want car engineers. It's very, very interesting. And then you look at a GE, is it GE? Yeah, GE mm -hmm. ads that are running all the time with a kid getting the cool job. I mean, in American Express, I don't boss a journal story about the same thing. Everybody wants to be this, they want to become software company. Technically. They need coders, you know, even if you're an old mining company. Uh, right, what else? Sorry, yeah, well, you know, so, so, you know, going along with that, I mean, GE was, you know, Jeff Immer was on stage at Gartner and was saying, you know, hey, look, we expect that, you know, GE will be a software company to the tune of $15 billion, you know, by 2020. I mean, that's a pretty bold prediction. And I think really what goes with that, the second piece of everyone becoming a software company is 2016 is going to be uh, the year of the algorithm. So figuring out how to use all this data that's out there in a meaningful way to, to, you know, not just say data could be used for a decision, but we've got to find prescriptive ways to make those decisions. Because if we rely on our current culture around, you know, whether it's top-down driven decisions or consensus decisions or, you know, you know majority decisions, that, that's going to create a lot of difficulty for organizations culturally, that shift. And so we've got to find ways to build ag algorithms that we trust and that then create prescriptions of like, here are some options. You know, Erin, to your point, right, around capacity management, you know, driving to the lowest cost may not always be the best option. There may be options when having spare capacity or bursting out is desirable so that there's no weight or so some perception of high performance. And so it's not just, you know, the capacity, but like driving the algorithms and aligning them with the kind of business that you're trying to drive. So whether it's placement of cabs for Uber or whether it's pricing of tickets and products for airlines and hotels, you know, I, th I, th I think we're going to see a real shift as companies start to think more about the data that they have and, and what data they can complement it with from outside to create algorithms that create more uniqueness for their business. And we might see some, you know, further on segmentation of business models that in the past have been kind of commodity and head-to-head -head competition. We might start to see some more segmentation again of those of those markets as they redefine the the, the markets and the positioning that they're in with these newfound powers from, from algorithms. Yeah, I think Simon, you just said something interesting about you know the data and. This notion that uh, data lives everywhere and nobody should be one, there's no single owner of any type of data. If data is available to everybody and everybody can leverage those different sources of data, then you can really start to uncover some interesting things that perhaps had never even been conceived of uh, before. I, I just keep on going back to this notion in my mind of when you free the data, everybody wins. And by everybody, I mean not just the people doing the work, but the customer and the entire supply chain and the business model. Um, and, and so these multiple sources of data, and you keep on talking about being prescriptive. And we've been talking a lot, uh, you know, internally amongst our team about being predictive and prescriptive. And there's a, an analyst firm that talks about getting away from describing what happened in a point in time, because let's face it, that ship sailed. It's about what does the future look like, defining that white space and then just going after it and letting the data guide you. And if you take off the, Kind of some of those traditional notions that you, we've we've carried, um, and and consider yourself to your point, Simon, and you know consider yourself a software company instead of whatever traditional kind of company you are. There is a a massive opportunity for people, for teams, and and for cultures to really really uh, evolve in clever ways. I want an app that actually, I understand Amazon and those guys uses really clever algorithms to, in, to have elastic pricing. I want the opposite so I can know when I need to go shop. 
right? Where's my talk? Because I think you think about this as a, a, a next wave of literacy. You know, when literacy spread in Europe, the, the society changed. If we can give data literacy, if you will, to the average person, whether that is Silicon Valley or in Zambia, uh, I think the world can change for the better very quickly in, in a you know evolutionary jump rather than you know day to day improvements. So it's a very 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 fascinating discussion. And I like that both of you sort of came to the same conclusion there on the prediction for the next year. It's very interesting how both of you working in different different parts of the valley. You're still thinking in the same lines. It's always cool to see. Great uh, minds think alike, Simon. There you go. And uh, before we leave, uh, first of all, what happened to the Christmas decorations, Simon? Well, let's see. Let's relocate. And there we go. How about that? Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. What do you wish for for Christmas as a gift? And nothing, no world peace. I'm talking about materialistic needs. <laughs> materialistic needs. Um, rose gold Apple Watch. <laughs> Ah, I like it. And Aaron? I haven't made my Christmas list because I'm still shopping for the toddler. Come on now. What, what, what would you really need? A skateboard? Oh. Nothing. Oh, happy coworkers, Elf. That's what I need. Happy coworkers. I, I can see Aaron on the hoverboard. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I'm quite that coordinated. Um, in, a, in a sign of the changing times, as, as my two kids get to early teenage status, I got a Christmas list from them, you know, saying, you know, here's some Lululemon leggings that I would like, and then here's the URL from Target that I'd like you to buy them from. <laughs> just click here, Dad. Yeah, they don't even say that. They just send me links. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what we do Santa's is Santa's Day is maybe numbered, I fear. <laughs> they, go in, they go in and they fill up carts, and then we pick what we want. So they, that's yeah, how they make a list. This is the shopping cart. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is my future, or a glimpse of my future. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's the hint. Yes, it, this, is, this is predictive analytics for you. <laughs> that's why I need that app to afford all of this. Well, thank you both very much for coming on the Christmas show. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll see you all again next year. And we'll do more of these. Merry For all Christmas. of you out there. Thanks, Al. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.